So uh, we're happy to have Dr. Philip Audala, who's the Director of Computational Biology and a Senior Investigator at the Ontario Institute for Cancer Research, um, a Professor of Population and Medical Genomics at the University of Toronto, and Executive Scientific Director at the Ontario Health Study. He's also the Director of Genome Canada, Canadian Data Integration Centre, and the National Scientific Director of the Canadian Partnership for Tomorrow Health, or CANPATH. So Dr. Awadala and his team focus on the development of genomics approaches, model-based tools, and population-based approaches to study mutation rates, genome biology, and cancer. His team's research has enabled the development of tools to capture rare de novo variants and pathways critical to cancer disease phenotypes and responses to therapies. His main research interests include identifying genomic determinants of blood disorders and cancer, understanding mutation and recombination biology, and genomic epidemiology of age-related disorders in population cohorts. Uh, he also leads Canada's largest longitudinal population cohorts to develop precision medicine research and understand the genetic and environmental contributors to disease development. So today we're really excited to hear um, his talk and I'll um, let him take it from here. Thanks. Great. Thank you very much for the intro and thank you very much for the invitation as well. And very happy to be speaking at uh, St. Justine and University of Montreal again. Um, so one of the things that I thought I would do for this presentation, this presentation is going to come in three parts. Um, what I'm hoping to do is motivate um, people's research, uh, people's interest in using population cohorts for both fundamental and clinically applied science, science activities. And so you're going to hear a little bit about, uh, at the beginning of this talk, about Canada's largest population cohort. And hopefully we, we'll get a sense of why we spend so much effort and resources in, 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 in supporting this type of activity. And then the last two um, sections of this talk will, will show how this cohort can enable um, both basic fundamental re basic or fundamental research as well as applied research, especially as it relates to studying cancers. And so hopefully it all kind of will make sense and come together. And I think I might talk a little bit about how we're mobilized to study COVID at the very end of this presentation as well. And so that's why you know, we've titled this, co this um, uh, presentation today, Using the CANPATH Population Cohort and you'll hear about CANPATH in just a moment to detect and analyze the evolution of early cancer. So um, let's see if I can get my slides to move forward. Okay, so I'm gonna have to use my mouse there. So again, just one of the reasons that we're trying to motivate this program is that we, we've been building this cohort um, to study Canadians and to study Canadians who will likely, in all likelihood, most Canadians will develop a chronic disease. So here's just some high level numbers that we, we uh, that I've put together for you, uh, where one in two Canadians will be diagnosed with the cancer, one in 12 Canadians will live with a diagnosed heart disease, and one in 10 Canadians live with asthma or COPD. And often these diseases are often comorbid as well. One of these leads, diseases may lead to the development of another disease as well. Um, and one of the things that we try to do with this population cohort is capture information about individuals before they develop those diseases. And one of the reasons why we wanna do that is because we know that early interventions and prevention is the most effective way to treat, say, cancer. And so this slide is here just kind of motivating that where we're saying, you know, cancer survival improves when diagnosed at its earliest stages. So we're in the business of, and, and both at my research institute, I sit at the Ontario Institute for Cancer Research, and a, a, a good uh, um, primary focus of most of the students and postdocs and research scientists I have working with me are trying to understand and detect and capture cancer at its earliest stages. To do that, um, uh, we need to be able to look at it um, before people are actually in the clinic being diagnosed at stage one to stage four. Um, generally, the way cancers are screened in, in, in the population there is, you know, depending on which cancer type, you know, for example, breast cancers, um, regular mammography, particularly in Canada, starts happening at age 50 um, for every two to three years. For things like prostate cancers, which I don't have here, these are our traditional screening tools, prostate cancers, PSA. It's not a terribly effective tool for screening, um, but again, we're looking at but increasing or improving our ability to screen for these cancers. Um, that may be more effective or have higher efficacies in some of these tools as well. Um, so we're interested, as I said before, trying to get at these individuals in our population, people who are potentially destined to develop these cancers, 
um, and see what they look like before they, you know, the full on, uh, uh, the full development of that disease. And this is where population cohorts comes in. A longitudinal large scale population health cohort captures these individuals in the population before these, these individuals develop a disease. And we capture a lot of this information. We capture a lot of information about these individuals so that we could potentially identify risk factors that might lead to the development of these diseases. And also by identify signatures in their data that might be used to develop or to see or detect an, a cancer before at its earliest stages. So, popula so population cohorts are effectively population laborato laboratories, right? And they're invaluable for understanding, you know, who's going to develop a disease, potentially identify genetic determinants, gene by environment interactions, and developing these diseases as well. So that is the motivation for building these large cohorts across the world. And CANPATH is our answer to developing a population health research plat platform. CANPATH stands for the Canadian Partnership for Tomorrow's Health. And it is Canada's largest health population health research platform with, a mo with an aim or motivation to assess the effects of genetics, behavior, family health history, and environment on chronic disease. It is a, effectively a collaboration of cohorts um, where we have put together across nine provinces, and we're actually now in all 10 provinces. Um, you'll see a little bit more information about that in a moment. Uh, data for 330,000 Canadians that is one in a hundred Canadians have agreed to be part of this project. And if you like, it's one in 50 Canadians who are within our targeted age range of recruitment as well. Um, we'll get to that in a moment as well. Um, as I said, it's a confederation of cohorts as well. Canada's a confederation, it's a confederation of cohorts. The Atlantic provinces are all one cohort, for example. I also lead the Ontario Health Study, um, which is here, of course. And I used to run a program now being run by Simone Gravel, uh, Philippe Rouet, and uh, Guillaume Lett, um, the Cartagen activity, uh, which again is a member cohort of the uh, this uh, of CanPath, and CanPath has captured information about you know uh, health through surveys. Um, some individuals were invited to cap uh, through, uh, to provide physical measures through an on-site visit. We've captured biologics that supports things like genomics, and we're actively following these individuals up over time. Um, this program has been around for a while. It is a longitudinal cohort. We've started the baseline recruitment of some of these activities back as early as 2008. So it's already a cohort that's around 13 or 14 years, uh, um, uh, has data for about 13 or 14 years. And that speaks to, if you like, the strength of the cohort. And it arguably, it's really coming into its own now uh, with regard to its, its, uh, its value. The individuals who have come into our cohort, um, anywhere from age ranges from 40 to 69, let's say, in Cartagen or 35 to 75 in Ontario, are now aging and they are now developing diseases. So we've captured a lot of information about these individuals over time um, with regard to things that lead up, lead to the development of the diseases. Um, as I said before, it's a confederation of programs. I mentioned Ontario Health Study in Cartagen, the Atlantic provinces are all part of one cohort called Atlantic Path. Um, these are the names I don't, uh, of the other activities ongoing. We're actively still recruiting um, as part of baseline in Manitoba and just getting things underway in Saskatchewan. In the other regions where we've ended baseline and we're capturing follow-up information in these, in these, in these individuals. Um, these, these are the individuals who are part of this great leadership team um, I, I'm uh, the National Coordinating Center for CANPATH is out of the University of Toronto, and I co-lead that with John McLaughlin. And here you've got the individuals who are leading all of the individual regional cohorts or activities uh, across Canada as well. As I mentioned, 330,000 Canadians are followed longitudinally. This is the breakdown across Canada. Uh, Ontario Health Study has a lion's share of the activity um, in terms of number of individuals uh, consented and recruited. Um, not far behind is, uh, is Quebec and Alberta, and generally on our, um, you know, BC and Atlantic have around, sorry, not generally, but BC and Atlantic have recruited around 30 to 35,000 participants. All of our participants have consented to allowing us to recontact them, um, and to recontact them, and I'm going to put that in quotes, in a number of different ways. We recontact them directly, we ask them to engage in various activities, follow-up surveys, uh, potentially an ancillary study, 
Uh, what we're doing with COVID um, is arguably an ancillary study, and you're going to hear more about that later, where we're capturing information about COVID, antibodies, vaccine efficacy, and so on. Um, but they all they also have allowed us and consented to us allow uh, to allow us to link to administrative health records across Canada. The great majority of CanPath participants have consented to that, and that means we can look into the cohort, look who came into the cohort potentially healthy, and then has since developed a disease as validated or verified by looking uh, at their data within the administrative, through some sort of administrative health record. Um, we have a number of ways of doing that. You'll hear a little bit more about that today. Um, that linkage to administrative health record is critical, but the other things that it also allows us, to, those linkages and those consents allow us to also link to other things like environmental data exposures. Uh, people have given us their six digit postal codes. Our part, we know where our participants live. And so we could potentially link out and to things like at either a three digit or six digit code, uh, postal code resolution, things like air pollution. Um, uh, I'm not gonna get into this too much today, but you know, urban densities and so on, all of these things are determinant uh, factors associated with who develops a chronic disease. Uh, very quickly, this is just a high level overview of some of the variables we've captured. In fact, there's about 600, if you go to the CANPATH portal, you'll see about 650 high level variables and they can be fractionated down to sub variables if you like. But we also have collected biologics from our participants and from about 100,000 participants in CANPATH, we have physical measures as well. A good, a good, a substantial number of those come from, from Cartagen. And in fact, these are the data, these are the kinds of data you can get from about 20,000 participants with regard to physical measures at Cartagen as well. Uh, we do have biologics for about over 160,000 participants now, in fact, um, where we're now called doing things like doing DNA extractions, genotyping. Genotyping across the cohort is now complete for around 46,000 participants. Um, we actually have way more blood spots than this now. We initially only had about 10,000 blood spots. We now have closer to uh, around uh, 37, actually 40,000 blood spots, in part supporting by the COVID-19 activities that we have ongoing as well. Uh, I mentioned that we have genotyping data. We actually have in uh, some of the regions as well, more active work in places like whole genome sequencing, exome sequencing. Uh, I have a single cell RNA sequencing program um, started out of the Ontario Health Study where we have biologics that will support single cell activities. I won't be talking about today. Uh, of course we can, uh, and we have a number of what we call boutique genomic activities. Some of them are driven by external researchers who are coming into the cohort. Some high level summaries of the data um, in terms of what people have told us about their, what types of things that they've developed. Uh, we actually have a marker paper where people tell us things like, how do they perceive their health? Uh, what kinds of things they've been diagnosed, self-declared information about say things like cancers or diabetes. We can actually validate through linkages to administrative health records. So, of 330,000 participants at baseline, 30,000 participants have told us that they were diagnosed with the cancer. Around 70,000 participants told us that they were hypertensive and about 21,000 participants told us that they were uh, diagnosed with type two diabetes. All of this is uh, highlighted in a, in a marker paper um, that was published in CMAJ about two or three years ago. Um, we're in the field doing follow-up uh, with these participants as well. So we have follow-up questionnaires um, that we are actively um, that are actively being used by our operations teams to capture up follow-up information as well as for information with regard to COVID. And as I said, data linkages enable us to evaluate um, our cohort in real time as well. Uh, the last thing I'm going to highlight with regard to what we've been doing in CanPath is been linking to environmental exposures um, through other activities that we've partnered with, um, specifically the canoe activity. Uh, CANU is a, the Canadian Urban Environmental Health Research Consortium. It has leads uh, throughout Canada, including in Montreal, um, left by, led by Jeff Brook at the University of Toronto. Um, that allows us to effectively take all of our participants in CANPATH and ad identify certain types of exposures. Um, and exposures could be, say, uh, urban density, for example, like what we're showing here. I have one uh, postdoc working specifically on how uh, developing machine learning tools to extract uh, information from say urban density and predict, in this case, it's just an elastic regression and potentially pre predict obesity 
Um, uh, and it's actually, you can see here actually that it doesn't do a terrible job. In fact, it does a pretty decent job of being able to predict uh, obesity in the CANPATH data. So it just gives you a sense of the kinds of things that we can use when we have a lot of information and people tell us a lot about themselves in terms of say in this case, BMI, things that they might be exposed to. And in this case, that might be urban density or from get, getting information about where they live. The very last thing I wanna mention is because of our size, CANPATH is the only Canadian program associated with international efforts like uh, the International 100,000 Cohort Consortium, which I'm also on the steering committee for. And in fact, actually we just ended our first day of our third annual meeting. Um, and it includes other major activities like UK Biobank, which I'm sure many of you have heard of, which is probably one of Can uh, the world's most important health projects and has collected a lot of information about, on about a half a million people as well. Um, this is just a quick snapshot of what can, uh, what that uh, uh, of our flagship paper actually for the International Cohort uh, Consortium. All right, so I wanna get into some science now, and that's just an overview of the resource. And what I'm gonna be talking about in the next two elements of this program or this uh, presentation today is how we've used everything I've just described in a couple of projects around early cancer detection and studying early cancer evolution. So the first project's mostly gonna be about early cancer detection. And it's motivated in part by our ability um, to do what I was describing before, being able to identify through administrative health linkages in the various regions across Canada, um, samples and participants who came into the CANPATH cohort and have since developed, say, cancer. So I'm actually today gonna to be focusing mostly on the work that we do in Ontario, on the Ontario Health Study, and our ability to link to, say, Cancer Care Ontario, and identify individuals who are either early or incident cases of cancer in our cohort. Um, this is just a snapshot of how you might wanna be able to do these, um, these, these linkages across Canada and these various provinces. One thing I wanna highlight is we actually have a, a program that where we're doing this nationally with CANPATH with something called the Canadian Institute for Health Informatics. And through CANPATH, you'll be able to get a national linked data set linking to things like ICD codes. So what is it what I mean that we're by us doing linkages? So one of the things that we are doing is we, in doing administrative health linkages, what we do say in Ontario is apart from, you know, getting the usual kinds of ethics approvals and so on, what we've done in Ontario is we've given programs or registered entities like Cancer Care Ontario or ICAES, which is Integrative Clinical Evaluative Studies, all of the Ontario Health Study participant names, so for Ontario Health Study, as well as some people in Quebec, have provided health insurance information so that we can link those individuals um, in our cohort to data at those prescribed registered entities. And so in doing so, we're able to then identify anybody in the cohort who has developed a cancer. In this project, I'm particularly interested in identifying individuals who gave us a blood sample and had yet to be diagnosed with a cancer. So in, in, in principle, I'm interested in seeing if there are individuals who are what we call incident cancers um, rather than prevalent cancers. A prevalent cancer by our definitions would be somebody who came in and said that they were diagnosed with the cancer. An incident case would be somebody who over time had developed a cancer, but had come into the cohort. And so that gives us a lot of, an ability to build a picture like this, where for the incident cancers, we might've had a participant join the cohort, gave us a blood sample, had since been diagnosed with an incident cancer, and we capture that information through data linkage. And that's what we're showing you here is, these are the kinds of ways we can just graphically demonstrate those ind individuals. And so going back into this pie chart, we actually have for the Ontario Health Study around a few hundred individuals who have de developed an incident breast cancer, a few hundred individuals, maybe about a hundred individuals who've de developed say a blood malignancy as well. And so this is um, actually some work that I'm gonna be presenting now is actually work that was just a, presented as a plenary at the American Society of Human Genetics about two weeks ago by my fabulous PhD student, Nicholas Cheng. And generally this is what we're showing up, showing you here is you know, scaling these things by when a participant gave us a blood sample, this gives you an indication of when these individuals might have developed a breast cancer since they gave us um, that sample. Um, breast cancers are far, obviously far more common than say pancreatic cancers. So the number of pancreatic cancers 
that are incident cases in the OA Ontario Health Study are not nearly as many. We only have about 16 or 17 of those individuals. But generally you see here that we have blood samples that in some cases are like within six months of a diagnosis, in some cases, many years, up to seven years of a diagnosis. And same things can be said for prostate cancers. So that just gives you a sense that for these cancers, and we have obviously information for many other cancers, we have a plenty, we have plenty of blood samples sitting in our biobank pre-diagnosis. So um, we can use this information to start really exploring what's in those samples that might lead us to being able to capture potentially a signature of early cancer. Um, just getting into a little bit more of the granularity with this slide, um, here we can also, through our administrative cancer registry data, or through the Ontario Cancer Registry, capture things like stage. So we've got a lot of information about stage that we're trying to compile here in this figure. So these are the samples that are, would say, within a year of being diagnosed, two years of being diagnosed, up to six years of being diagnosed. Most participants in Ontario, because they have active mammography screening, are stage one with some stage two and, and, and some later stages as well. You'll see very distinct differences for something like pancreatic cancer and actually gives an argument as to why an early detection tool is critical for something like pancreatic cancer where most of the participants or many participants are actually being uh, captured or diagnosed late stage, like stage three and stage four. When the, when, the, when the cancer is no longer localized. And as I mentioned at the very beginning of our talk, where treatments become a lot less efficacious. And of course, these are the similar data that we have for prostate cancer. Prostate cancers, most of our participants in Ontario are being diagnosed actually at stage two, in fact. So not, we don't have as effective screening tools for prostate as we say do for breast. So we're interested in developing early detection tools. And one way to do that is by looking at our blood samples and seeing if we can see signatures of these tumors that are growing somewhere in the body in blood samples. And so you probably have heard of something called cell-free DNA, which is what CFDNA stand for. And there we're looking for signatures of those cancers in our biologics. And what that allows us to do is potentially molecular subtype the cancers as well. So we're going to be spending a little bit of time talking about not just capturing the cancer, but identifying the tissue of origin and potentially also subtyping those cancers, which would presumably um, uh, improve both our monitoring and potentially uh, uh, detecting a disease such that treatments are more effective. There are a number of ways of capturing signatures in, of cell-free DNA associated with cancers. One way is looking at somatic mutations that might be associated with tumor development or clonality within tumors. We're going to be focusing today on looking at DNA methylation. Uh, in part, we, we focus a lot on DNA methylation because in our hands, DNA methylation and a number of other teams' hands, DNA methylation is very effective at not only capturing cancers or discriminating healthy tissue from cancer tissue, but also discriminating tissue, spec uh, tissue types as well. And so this is just giving you a signature of some of the, give you an indication of some of the tools that we are developing. This is just a simple principal component plot here using methylation signatures um, from different tissues, but we use these tools to train our models to help identify and uh, not just the cancers, but the tissue of origin of those cancers as well. And you can see here that these tools work pretty well. Um, around 98% accuracy. So with our collaborators, particularly at on Ontario Institute for Cancer Research and Princess Margaret Hospital, Daniel D. Carvalho and Scott Bratman in particular, we've been developing assays for capturing methylated DNA and cell-free DNA. It's called MEDIP effectively, methylation. Um, I'm not gonna get into the whole acronym, but it's effectively a tool for enriching our sequencing uh, such that we capture the methylation signatures in, in the samples. And you can see here that we do actually a pretty good job of discriminating in our cases versus our controls, cancers, right? And so I'm showing you here in, our, in, a, in, what we're, in our, a very simple model where we're looking at differential DNA methylation between cases in the Ontario Health Study of incident breast cancers and comparing them to controls that we capture a lot of features a lot of methylated features that didn't discriminate cases and controls. And using a, a simple unsupervised plot, you can see here that our cases in our samples are capturing breast cancer many years before they're traditionally diagnosed uh, compared to controls. We made a 
a lot of efforts to ensure that our controls are age and sex and other, uh, other phenotype matched in terms of things like things like smoking, type two diabetes, other age and so on. Um, but you can see here really nicely in this picture that we're capturing before a traditional diagnosis and much earlier than mammography, in fact, and we, I don't have, we have data to show how well we're doing compared to mammography, but I don't have that here today, that we're able to capture breast cancers far earlier um, as up to seven years, in fact, before traditional diagnosis. Um, this is breast cancer again here, and this is prostate cancer. So some early results we have for prostate cancer. Again, you can see our prostate cancers are in colors by age, and we're discriminating prostate cancer using these unsupervised pictures here um, compared to our controls. Um, not only is our, um, we've, we've, we've uh, I, I didn't spend a lot of time today uh, showing that uh, we, we actually have um, uh, a machine learning classifier that we've now developed um, that did not only discriminates breast, from, uh, breast cancers from controls, but you can see here that using other data, um, published data from or, uh, projects like um, uh, the um, PCOG, uh, Pain Cancer Analysis of Whole Genomes Project, that we're able to use some of the features that we're capturing that discriminate breast cancers from controls, we can actually discriminate subtypes. Oops. Ah. Um, and so we can discriminate luminal A from luminal um, from basal, luminal B and luminal A, we can't seem to discriminate, but we can certainly discriminate basal cancers from some of these other subtypes. More work to be done. You can see that we can't really discriminate some of these other cancers that well, like HER2, but we actually don't have the sample sizes quite there yet. Um, and in fact, we just had to do another pull from Cancer Care Ontario to get increase our sample sizes. So we're not only capturing incident breast cases from controls, but we're also in some ways able to, um, to uh, discriminate subtypes. And this gives you an idea of what, how well our, 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 our classifiers are doing. And for some things, we're actually above 80% in terms of accuracy, in terms of things like sensitivity and you know, in terms of overall accuracy and our sensitivity for individuals under the age of 50, which I think is really striking, is, um, uh, is over here. And it's, it's rather remarkably high compared to post 50, where we don't really understand why that's happening, in fact. Um, but we do think that might, what might be confounding some of our signatures in our post 50 group is age specific methylation. As we age, our DNA methylates, and that might be confounding some of the signatures in some of our older groups compared to our other groups. But generally, you can see here, these are general accuracies. I would never take an accuracy of 78% to clinic or 75% to clinic, so there's still more work to be done. But I would say that our sample sizes here are still pretty preliminary. Um, our confidence limits come around using a cross-validation approach. Um, and so we need to be doubling, I would say, our sample sizes to get some of these sensitivity specificity numbers up. This is where we are with pancreatic cancer. I mentioned really quickly that we have some small numbers for pancreatic cancers, and you can see our pancreatic cancers are doing remarkably well at 96%. So I'm, I'm pretty excited about this. Uh, we're able to early, early detect pancreatic cancers um, uh, many years uh, before the traditional diagnosis again. And so that's pretty exciting. So this comes back to CANPATH. There are only about 20 participants and we've had to pull some data from other sources to get these numbers here. Um, but from Ontario, we only had about 20 incident cancers, but having a cohort like CANPATH allows us to increase our cohort and identify other incident cancers. So just to summarize here with our early detection tools, I hope I've been able to, to get across the fact that Having a population laboratory of biologics that comes in in what arguably would be considered a control individual becomes a case with time, right? And I remember one time, maybe 12 years ago, when somebody asked me, well, why would you want to take over a project like Cartagen or the Ontario Health Study when these are just big population control cohorts? Well, they're not. Everybody becomes a case. And what we have here is a way to use the biologics stored in these biobanks, coupled with the data we've captured for these individuals to identify what could be extremely critical early cancer detection signatures, which then speaks to, to how early are these cancers actually evolving, right? How, and, and do they eventually take, and what does it take for them to start to accelerate in terms of their growth as well? So it starts speaking to biology as well. Okay, so that's summarizing some work there. Now, other work I wanted to highlight 
um, is some work that's done by another very talented uh, student in my lab, Kimberly Steed. And this is work working not on solid tissues or solid can tumor tissues, but on blood. And here we're thinking about the kind of factors that lead to blood malignancies uh, rather than solid tissue malignancies and the kinds of things that we can capture in blood like somatic mutations. So before I was talking about methylation signatures, here I'm gonna be talking about mutations that occur in blood and then thinking specifically about somatic mutations that might accumulate in hematopoietic stem cells, right? It's becoming extremely topical, um, this whole process of something called age-related clonal hematopoiesis. Um, you can't go to a blood meeting or even the American Society of Human Genetics meeting and not hear about age-related clonal hematopoiesis, which is the progression of somatic mutations which develop, say, in stem cells and begin to take over in the, the, not just the hematopoietic stem pool, but in blood uh, populations as a whole. Um, what I'm presenting today is actually work that Kim actually had as a platform presentation at ASHG um, a couple of weeks ago as well. So one of the questions that we're particularly interested in is, when do these somatic mutations accrue? When do they develop? And what leads to them starting to take over? Why do some somatic mutations start taking over in terms of, in terms of the blood population? And why do other ones not? Uh, do not? Do not. So that leads us to thinking about how do we think about modeling this sort of mutational behavior? And so we know that mutations in driver genes are common even in healthy individuals, and yet they do not lead to, say, leukemia, right? And ARCH we know to be a precondition of some of these blood malignancies, but not everyone who has ARCH will develop into um, to a malignancy. So that's, those, that frames sort of the questions like, why do certain people who have ARCH go towards a disease and some people do not? And so we thought about it this through a population genetics lens where we're trying to, in, in, in fact, identify genes or mutations or cell populations, which might be, say, subject to positive selection. So if they're subject to pop positive selection, those clones will start to grow in the population. Maybe not all mutations are subject to positive selection. They might either be neutral and just going up and down in terms of frequency with age, um, just by chance. Some might be subject to negative selection, so not all mutations are gonna be good for a cell. Most mutations will in fact be either neutral or bad for a cell. And of course, none of the, not all mutations occur by themselves. So they obviously occur, potentially might be occurring uh, in the context of other cells and that we call a combination model. So what I'll be describing here now is somatic mutations and I'm gonna break this down into point mutations, like put mutations that impact like a nucleotide base versus somatic mutations that impact structural variants. Um, and the structural variant stuff is actually terribly new. And so I'm gonna be spending a little bit of time talking about that at the end, but first I'm gonna be talking about how we do evolutionary modeling of point mutations. So what we, what we tried to do is we trained a effectively, it's, this is a synthetic supervised modeling approach where we simulated many, many different evolutionary scenarios, subjects to say positive selection, negative selection, neutral selection, or combinations thereof. And then we trained a classifier to distinguish between those models, then evaluated how well that classifier is doing. And this is what you're seeing here is that using our simulations and our classifier, our neural, uh, the, the deep neural network that Kim had developed, um, actually is extremely effective in discriminating amongst different evolutionary models using information that, we, that, that goes into the training that includes things like population allele frequencies, missense mutations, non-silent mutations, and so on. And then once we have a classifier, we apply it to actual real data. And the real data that I'm talking about here will be blood samples that again come from a population cohort of individuals who had yet to develop, say, a malignancy. And then what we wanted to do is identify, see if that information can help us identify why certain individuals developed into a malignancy and why indiv some individuals did not. So interestingly, uh, blood is governed by many selective pressures. So, and that's not terribly surprising. We saw that for some participants, a negative selection model fit the data better than uh, a, uh, say a positive selection model. But what I thought was pretty striking was in fact, 
even amongst individuals who went on and were destined to become leukemic. So our, in our samples, because they had yet to be developed the leukemia, they were pre-leukemic, only about, it's almost an equal distribution of among individuals who were controls com compared to pre-leukemics where there was a signature of positive selection. And in fact, um, the model that best fit individuals or the, the majority of individuals who were pre-leukemic was a combination model, a model where you either had a combination of positive mutations as well as negative mutations accruing in stem cells. Um, and it seems that there are only a small number of these genes that are exclusively mutated in these different evolutionary classes as well. Um, these tools are actually quite useful in our hands um, as well, hopefully as well as in other hands as well, as being able to discriminate the different individuals as terms of who is going to be AML free versus those who will go on to develop AML. And so you can see here, um, this is a paper that came out of Nature Communications, so I just wanted to highlight that at the bottom there, is that um, depending on which model you, the samples fit, um, was actually predictive of whether individuals would go on to being uh, AM, ha having AML versus those that do not. Um, so the last thing I wanted to talk about uh, was not just point mutations, but somatic structural variants. And there's been a lot of effort trying to capture not just point mutations as they accrue in blood, but mutations come in many different flavors. And in fact, in the UK Biobank, there's been a lot of activity. There's a series of high profile nature publications that have captured the these larger structural variants that accrue in blood uh, somatically. We've been doing the same thing with data in CANPATH. Um, and you can see that we're actually getting snapshots of where these things are occurring across chromosomes that are consistent with other projects, including projects like the Thousand Genomes Project. You can see here for some reason, we do not know why, um, we're getting an excess of these types of structural variants accruing in places like the X chromosome compared to some other places in the genome as well. Um, and we don't see any real breakdown by um, ethnicity, which is not surprising. Um, these are somatic structural variants that accrue in somebody's blood. What we do see is that when we do try to capture these structural variants, the density of the genotyping array or how many markers we have in a genotyping array greatly impacts the number of structural variants we'll be able to detect. And that just comes, that's a resolution question. The more variants you have on the array, we're using genotyping arrays to capture these somatic structural variants. And the amount of information in those arrays is going to de depict how, how well we can capture a somatic structural variant. One of the things that we do see though, is that there is, well, we'd say a signature of some sort of selection where longer or larger structural variants are at smaller frequencies within an individual compared to smaller uh, structural variants as well. And that stands to reason. The, the smaller a structural variant, the less impactful it will be on a genome. And so they will be more likely to be tolerated with an individual compared to a structural variant, which is depending on the three, but actually it's not even dependent on the three different structural variant types that we're looking at. You will see that there's a re reduction in, um, in their overall frequencies. We've been looking at, uh, um, a few things associated well, with the actual functional impact of these structural variants. We actually, for, for some programs, have access to genotyping, sorry, gene expression data. We've been applying, I'm not gonna be spending too much time talking about this today, but looking at, the, we've developed a burden analysis um, that looks at the impact of structural variants on at transcriptomes. And fascinatingly, we see these really interesting pictures where depending on the structural variant type, like a copy number loss of heterozygosity, versus a gain of a structural variant versus the loss of a structural variant, we get these nice fits of these quadratics that are telling us we have, to some extent, different ways of how these structural variants are being tolerated at the transcriptional level as well. So you can see that gains, um, what's on the, uh, this is the cumulative burden of the structural variant and its impact on the overall gene expression uh, level here on the x-axis as well. Um, so you're going to see here that moderate levels of gene expression for, say, gains of a structural variant are tolerated more so, whereas with losses, you're seeing a push out where extreme levels of gene expression are being tolerated uh, more so with both losses uh, that are copy number loss neutral, sorry, copy neutral versus the usual kind of losses as well. So that's the end of what I wanted to describe with regard to um, how we're using the population cohort to study cancer. 
The last thing I wanted to really quickly um, highlight is some work that we, where we're using the CANPATH cohort and what we're calling the COVID-19 initiative. And in fact, actually the funding we have for it is called Support Canada, where Public Health Agency of Canada, the COVID-19 Immunity Task Force, and CHR are supporting us in capturing information of our COVID-19 from over 100,000 Canadians. Um, we're doing a serological surveillance as well. Really quickly, we're capturing information about serology, uh, antibodies, uh, who's developing antibodies, who's not developing antibodies, both from COVID, also following vaccination. We're capturing blood spots. In fact, our participation rates are so high, we targeted 20,000 people. In fact, we had 30,000 people said they wanted to give us blood spots and then mail, we mailed them back their information about COVID-19. If you're interested, um, we'll be um, presenting a webinar, another CanPath webinar on this, um, on the COVID-19 work. Uh, really quite fascinating in terms of who in the population is not developing antibodies following a double dose of vaccination and what kind of, even, uh, when we're talking about the, the Moderna, Pfizer's, and AstraZeneca's and, and the mixed vaccination protocols as well. So I don't want to say too much about that here. If you're interested in CANPATH and our data, everything I just described to you today is from a resource that is available to you. It's not the Awadala cohort, it is the CANPATH cohort. Um, that, this portal is here for external research use environment. Here in this portal, you'll be able to identify things that you might be interested in that might be support, able to support some of your research. We have a team that would support you. Um, this is a very helpful team here uh, at our National Coordinating Center that would be able to help you uh, get access to some of the material that any, any of the material impact that I just talked about here today as well. So Asha would probably, Asha Mohammed's our access offer and she'd be your first line uh, of discussion uh, with regard to getting access to the data as well. So um, I'd like to thank you uh, for listening um, and also thank the CANPATH participants who've taken part in this cohort and I'm happy to take any questions um, from you here about the types of things that we talked about here today. Great, thanks Phil. That was a really nice overview of some exciting stuff. Um, I'm gonna start with a question because I always joke that I'm, I invited you so I get to ask the first question. Um, uh, but my first, uh, my question is really on the, on Kim's work, um, which we had seen, uh, I had heard her presentation a couple of times. I think it's just really fascinating work. Um, so we're interested in, in my lab on using population dynamics approaches in clonal hematopoiesis. So for example, in atherosclerosis and looking at drivers and how inflammation can affect um, you know, clonal development in the blood system. And I'm wondering if there were, you've thought about or, there, whether it's even useful in this context where you might have this combination negative and positive selection using pop gen approaches to think about this in the inverse way, in a predictive way, or whether that's not really something that's that useful. No, I think it is terrible, would be terribly useful. I'm trying to actually design an experiment that might be able to use the kinds of modeling tools that we've developed right, to see how, how predictive are we, right? Mm -hmm. So whether it's combination or just discriminating genetic neutral evolution or genetic drift from uh, negative selection, right? I'm actually really impressed with how well, this is just population genetics back talk, if you like, but um, one of the big uh, hurdles in population genetics is being able to discriminate negative selection from neutrality. Um, and we actually do a really good job in our hands. I'm always a little bit worried about the combination models, but the negative and versus neutral works really well and negative versus positive selection works really well as well. Um, that's not to say that we don't have faith in the combination space, mm -hmm. but that just, just, to me, that just seems natural. We'd expect some mutations to be negative and neutral and, and positive. So the experiment that I'm trying to think of is now for some of our participants, we actually have multiple biologics. All right, so I'll be able to go into some of those individuals that we talked about earlier and pull their blood samples, do a deep coverage sequencing. And one of the things I kind of really quickly gleaned over is to capture those mutations, those somatic mutations requires high depth coverage sequencing. So we needed 500 X to thousand X coverage. And we can, but now we can do that in our, in our second phase of collection of some of those same participants. So that gives us an opportunity if this is answering your question, to look at how predictive 
we are. Are those populate? Are, do we? Is the signature that we're capturing at time point one indicative of what we should be seeing at time point, or predictive of what we should be seeing at time point two? Mm -hmm. I'm a little worried about a two time point model. Like ideally, you want three because <laughs> two is just a trend, and three is 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 more than a trend, <laughs> a little bit more, but. That, that's kind of how I'm thinking about what our next steps are. In fact, that's that's actually our very next steps. Yeah, yeah, I was thinking about it too in a like kinetic sense, which uh, I'm not sure you could get from your cohorts because you don't, uh, you know, that I, you wouldn't have that kind of um, information available, but, you know, making models where you have the kinet some baseline kinetics of, of turnover in the system, um, and then you know, looking at uh, given the signatures that's a, that are applied uh, or that are found, then um, moving it forward, and then also looking at that second time point. But oh, yeah, I see. Think, right, right, yeah, yeah. No, that that might be. Uh, um, so if I understand, um, it may be that we could identify other features hmm. that are in the cohort that should be uh, predictive of some of the things that we're looking for in terms of mutation accumulation at even a single time point as well as multiple time points too. Right? Yeah. So it could be that we could flip this around. Um, and we sort of tried to do that, like that lost Cox regression that I showed mm. speaks a little bit to that. Like the models themselves seem to be predictive of AML survival or long uh, or time of survival. Um, but it's not quite, and it's not exactly where, where, what you're thinking about there, but it's, it's sort of speaking to how well those models can be predictive of some of those outcomes. Yeah, yeah no, no, I think that that's, yeah. Um, okay, great. I'll open it up. Um, if other people have any questions, you can, um, use the chat. Sorry, I should have said this before or raise your hand or open your mic. I wonder also in your age, um, when you're talking about the DNA methylation, um, obviously, as we age, there's increased inflammation too. And so, you know, does this become a large confounder in these cohorts when you're going forward in age that can you really tease out these kind of effects in some way? I'm not sure. I mean, I guess you have information about, about comorbidities, but. Yeah, we were just having a lab meeting about this in, yesterday, in fact, because there are some individuals in our controls, for example, which look like at face value, if you look at their overall, like we have a methylation score or a score um, that comes out of the uh, out of the uh, out of the model, um, and they really stick out. And it could be that with age, um, they're you know as I mentioned, age and methylation are, are highly correlated. But you know, just doing a deeper, we just need to do a deeper dive as to why these controls look like cancers. Yeah. And one of the things that we can do in our cohort is go back in and see, do another pull. Maybe somebody actually developed another cancer. Like this is sort of the problem with your, your census. Is, it's your census is telling you at this time point, you haven't developed a cancer, but you might actually be developing a cancer. So our, some of our controls have that. With that said, and I didn't show this today, we get some very strong methylation signatures in plasma for people with arthritis with people like you wouldn't want to develop a, uh, this kind of tool for you know because somebody can tell you that they have arthritis that would be <laughs> um, but there is the but this speaks to anywhere there's damage in the body um, like type 2 diabetes you might start seeing this shedding of dna so this is where like trying to do what i said like matching controls um, is tough because there's only so much information that we have like i don't know if these people are running a marathon yeah. and or just ran a marathon before they came in and maybe they're super healthy but they're shedding a lot of dna so that's where you try to do of course discriminate a cancer specific methylation feature versus just something that would normally be in blood like arch we see that as well like the arch itself we see elevated methylation signatures as well so a lot of there's a lot of pre-filtering of the data that i didn't get into today right. and with regard to those features mm -hmm. Okay, we have a question in the um, chat. So it's from Abby. Thanks for the great informative talk. Can you please tell us more about the machine learning algorithms for cell-free DNA methylome profiling and are they available um, to the public somewhere? Um, they will be soon. Um, so it's largely a random forest classifier um, th that we developed here. Um, and in this case, we developed a lot of tools to try to figure out how to best 
implement them in a binary classifier sort of way. With that said, um, you know, one of the things that we noted, and this is, uh, is that these early detection methylation features might be extraordinarily sparse. And so we have this matrix, uh, we have this data sparsity problem, right? Mm -hmm. So what might be found in one individual might be in a methylation feature in region X and might be a methylation feature in region Y. And so when we trained and tested these models, um, we played a lot with how we, um, you know, parsed the cohort, like a 90-10 tra training test split or something like that um, versus a 50-50 training test split. And we landed actually on a 90-10. Uh, and where we spent a lot of time actually in the development of the, of the tool was in this convolutional um, approach to identify confidence limits because our sample sizes are still pretty limited, right? Mm -hmm. So we didn't have a, 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 you know, a, a set that we could leave out. Um, we wanted to be able to use as much information because of that data sparsity problem. And, uh, but doing this 1,000 convolutions allows us to effectively, actually, I think do a better job than just leaving out a, a random set of say 10 or 20 individuals as well. Uh, paper is just getting uploaded in fact to the journal. And they, once we have the go ahead to be able to release to like BioArchive and to GitHub, they will make us put a GitHub file in fact up. Um, it'll, it'll be available. So uh, you can keep your eyes peeled for anything from our lab uh, and Nicholas Cheng, who's the first author on that. Perfect. And, and when you get more, say, because you said you were just doing a poll, so I assume that there's obviously some, um, you know, work to clean the data, etc. Do you plan to keep the same 9010? You know, would you keep your training set and then just look in this new data how well you've you've done, or do you plan to retrain? I guess. I think we'll explore both. Yeah. I would, you know, what you ideally want is to have your train set and then clinician X at hospital, I don't know, Sinai has, doesn't have to retrain a model. That would be, that's the, uh, that's the dream. Um, but we'll have, I think, you know, we're in such uncharted territory in this pre-disease space. Yeah. It's very different than at diagnosis when the cancer is full on, there's potentially a lot of shedding of DNA and breast is the hardest one. Mm -hmm. Um, strangely enough, this is why you're not seeing a lot of, of, um, uh, Grail, which is a company that's out there um, advertising a lot about how well they can detect colorectal cancer and so on, but they're not talking about breast cancer, right? Breast is, so I'm actually really impressed about how well we're doing with breast, given how well mammography screening actually does as well, because people are, we're actually capturing it pretty early. Um, it's different, like for, maybe for pancreatic, the reason our signatures and our accuracies are so high, even with a small sample size, is because it's being captured, diagnosed late, and there's more shedding of the DNA. In, 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 the, in the blood. So ideally, yes, just to come back to your question, we'd love to be able to keep it, uh, like I would train the model and not have to retrain the model. But again, this data sparsity thing makes me think that that may be wishful thinking. Right, yeah, that makes sense. Uh, Juste or Justin, I'm not sure. Uh, yes, um, very interesting talk, but I had a question because um, you say you want this to keep going for longer in the future, and you say that the people that with the from the control group now are starting to develop some form of cancer, but what happens if, or maybe if you have already data on people that have a f first cancer, then they uh, get healthy again, and then they develop another one or, you know, throughout their lives. So if you go, like you were saying, over uh, 30, 50 years, that may happen. Do you have any information or have you thought about something like that? Um, right. So one of the things that we've been trying to do, in fact, is, again, this comes back to, actually, you're coming back to the, the control question. Why do some of our controls look like they might have a methylation feature that could be indicative of cancer. Um, and again, this is again, it's this is one of those things where there's there's some inherent noise in this data. So we don't want to be creating undue concern. It could be that somebody who is a control does have developed a cancer, but what we do to validate anybody who's actually pre pre-cancer is use the cancer registry to go back and look in the samples. Um, and there's a sufficient lag actually between our samples and when they were diagnosed, that it's unlikely that we're capturing an incident case of an unknown cancer in some of these controls. With that said, what we are making sure of is that when we're doing these polls, and this is part of the problem with doing these polls with like 
and this is something I try to talk about with people who were in the AI and machine learning space, is that getting access to data, sometimes you need to have a question uh, for a somebody like a somebody at the CHI or somebody who's at one of these uh, registries to be able to release this information. So part of the problem comes back, well, do you only want the breast cancers? And it's like, I would love all of the data that you have. Um, but if you can frame your question, you can capture in a way that allows them to release that information. I can at least see that even in my control core, they might have, or even in my case control, what other kinds of cancers might they have developed as well? Which leads us to where we would love to go with this is a pan-cancer signature, right? We would love to have, take the stuff we're doing with breast, prostate, pancreatic, we're now working on ovarian. We'd like to spend more time on some of these understudied ones as well um, and develop a pan-cancer signature or tool that would then allow us to be able to tell a patient who is walking into a clinician's office, not only do you have a cancer, but which cancer? I, you know, you don't, you know, sure, some individuals might be at more high risk for breast, and that's maybe why they're being screened. But it's, you know, many times you'll have individuals who will not necessarily have a known genetic risk factor, for example, but might be developing a cancer for melanoma, for example, right? You'd be able to take that. So that's where we'd like to, I don't know, that's not quite answering your question, but that's generally where we're hoping to go with this over time. Great. Um, perfect. Well, unless there are other questions, oh, sorry, there was one follow-up in the chat about the this classification. So for uh, pancreatic, uh, was the split 50-50 or 90-10? Uh, I'd have to go check <laughs> offhand. <laughs> but that, one, I think <laughs> that, that was a combination of using data that we, that we had, plus some other data from uh, a great collaborator of ours, Steve Gallinger. Um, that might have been a 50-50 split, in fact. Mm. So, okay, great. And that accuracy was 94%. Nice. Okay. Thank you. Great. Well, unless there are other questions, I just want to thank you again for just a fascinating talk and also for introducing people who may not have known about CANPATH. Um, and we look forward to, I know some, uh, I'm involved in some of these modeling of serological or in some way of these. So I'm interested to see, I assume that this is not just from the blood banks, the serological COVID-19, right? No, it's, no, we're, yeah. Yeah, no, if, uh, happy. And we're actually going to be giving all this data to McGill, who's yeah. hosting all of this through the CITF. Mm -hmm. But we'll have about 28,000 individuals with serological, like we're actually in, actively getting these blood samples and sending them to Sinai and Claude Gingra at Sinai is doing the serology. We have a, we have a, she has a three antibody test, which can discriminate vaccine from virus uh, response. And so, yeah, uh, that's the kind of data we're now generating. Yeah, I've seen some of it from the, the blood banks, but I think, you know, there are some issues obviously there because it's not a total cross-sectional type study, right? right. That's, yeah. But, and this comes back to what we can have at CANPATH too. Like we'll have pharm a pharmacological history from our participants. Are you a cancer survivor? If you're a cancer survivor, are you developing vaccine uh, antibodies and so on? So that comes back to who's getting a booster kind of thing. Yeah, that's a very important question. Well, we thank you very much and we look forward to uh, following your um, studies. And um, the next talk will be the first week of December, um, and it'll be on some within host modeling, I believe, it's by Veronica from Emory.